But thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Morelia, for suggesting that we get a like while, uh, while waiting. Uh, I apologize for the, the slowness, but Sherry, hello. Looks like you were first in the chat. And your snakes are on the way, your additional snakes. I really appreciate your adopting them. I appreciate everybody's help who's adopted some of the baby snakes. And they all have homes. Last recent live stream was the last one. I said I have a few left. No, I don't. I, I mean, some of them I still have, but they're spoken for and will be going to their new home soon. So appreciate that. Ashley N. as well. Good evening. We've got Geek Guy Lago in Comics. Hi. And as I mentioned, Mr. and Mrs. Morelia, thank you again for suggesting the likes. We've got six of them so far. Um, and Geek Guy, I guess I answered the question. It was I was a little late, but I'm here. So... Willie Bronson, hello. And Jimmy Greason, Vicabulous, Gretel, Critters and More, and Moombas. How am I doing? Well, I'm doing well. I'm, everything's crazy. I don't know if I've ever had a time this crazy in a, in a long time in my life, but uh, I'm, I'm good. Um, there are a lot of good things going on, as well as a lot of busy things. Sean Meister, hello. McNama29, and I'm glad you liked the video on the Bumblebee Millipedes, Geek Guy. Thank you. Good to hear. Doug, and let's see, Widow Budgie, here he is, Twilly himself. Looks like he's trying to take a nap. So, and welcome Willie. I'm glad that this is uh, apparently your first live stream. It's always nice to see old friends and new friends at the same time, so... Love that. Welcome. Leia, hello and welcome. Mooney's Exotics. And Willie, if you like isopods, you're, you're in the club. So you're good to go. Welcome. Uh, I, I do have a lot of questions from patrons today. I want to cover some of those. Um, so I'm going to pull up Patreon so I can get there. Um, and we'll look at some questions that were were sent in today. If I miss anything, patrons, please let me know. Hopefully I won't, but I'll, I'll try not to miss anything. Now, if the basic rule with these questions is I try to make sure I answer uh, as best I can, but some questions, obviously, if I don't know, I'll just let you know that I don't know. And Fishaholic, hello, welcome. So here we go. Firsty, first, firsty, <laughs> reading the question as I'm, you know, uh, trying to talk at the same time. So, Lacey um, Jessamine says, can you go over the gestation cycle for isopods? What age are they sexually mature once they have mated? How long do they develop their sac eggs in their sac? How long till those babies leave the sac, etc.? Great question. Unfortunately, it's a little hard to generalize because different species mature at different ages. Uh, for example, some of the smaller, uh, faster growing species like um, Trichorana, Tomentosa, the dwarf white, or uh, even Porcelionides prenosis, seem to mature in maybe two or three months. Some of the others can take over a year to mature, uh, and because isopods continue to grow after they become sexually mature, that compounds things, because size is not always a good indication of maturity, but on some species it is. Uh, some of the, like Porcelio ornatus, tends to reach a pretty large size before it starts reproducing. Armadillidium gestroy, same thing. So, for me, it took over a year for my armadillidium gestroid to reproduce, but I got them when they were very, very small. I didn't get any adults or even, like, sub-adults. They were all tiny when I got them. So, it took them over a year to reproduce. Um, and then, like I say, a, a dwarf white might take three months. And uh, once they... Uh, and that... So, sexual maturity depends, you know, partly on that, uh, on species to a large extent. But that gives you a ballpark figure from about three months to over a year. Then, once they have made it, how long do they build their eggs in their sac? This also depends on species. Um, a rubber ducky, for example, can produce offspring about every month. Um, some of the others take longer and don't reproduce as often. And the maturity of the eggs and the babies in the pouch, in the marsupium, uh, might vary from species to species, too. That's my suspicion. But usually if you see uh, a marsupium 
on the female. It's only going to be, you know, a month or a few weeks before they, they emerge. That, that's typically true. And once the, the time between the egg actually hatching and the time it leaves the sac, I think that varies too a lot. So um, I wish I could give you better information, but I don't want to say something and then, you know, find out I'm wrong. So, um, but hopefully that gives you some ballpark figures. So let's look at Geek Guy, Lego, and comics. I can't find Porcelia expenses for sale. What's your advice on finding isopods for sale? Well, isopods, because of the way they reproduce, they don't reproduce like fruit flies or crickets or roaches, you know? They, they're going to reproduce quite a bit slower than any of those. And so, um, unless someone has a really, really large number of isopods, it's really easy to have a colony and then run out when you sell you know, a decent number of them. And you have to keep a certain minimum number uh, or you're going to run out all the time. And so that's, uh, with things like Porcelio Expensis, they're not extremely prolific. They breed well. I mean, they're, they're one of my better breeders as far as large Porcelio go, like the large Mediterranean Porcelio. But they mature fairly slowly and they don't breed nearly as quickly as some of the others. So I would say find out, uh, find out about the good breeders and then just check frequently. You know, keep in your hat like uh, six or eight breeders um, who work with that particular species you're looking for. Check frequently. A lot of them have mailing lists you can sign up for. When something comes back in stock, um, that can be a great thing to do is sign up for that mailing list. And then as soon as they get in, sometimes you have to like, uh, subs usually you subscribe to the mailing list and sometimes they'll say, you can get a secret email message before everybody else does that says, okay, everything's going on sale one week before anybody else who's not on the mailing list can see. So that can be a good way to get in. Hopefully that helps. Theropod Hunter and Ruby. Hey, Ruby and Luna. Excellent to see you here. They're uh, patrons. So that's great to see you. Maxwell, hey. And the little bird's name is Twilly. He's my daughter's bird. We've had him for about five and a half years, something like that. He speaks. Uh, you can actually hear him. In my most recent video on Armadillidium klugai, you can hear him speaking at the end of the video. So it's kind of fun. Jeff, hello. Mooney's Exotics. Oh, well, thank you. Glad you love the videos. Question from Mr. and Mrs. Morelia. When sanitizing softwood from outside to bring it in for an ice pot enclosure, how long to freeze would be safe from introducing pests? Great question. You can minimize, I'm not going to say eliminate, minimize the effects from pests that you would introduce by freezing the wood for uh, 72 hours. That is the amount of time that APHIS suggests for freezing uh, isopod uh, you know, refuse when you're, you're throwing away a uh, substrate. Uh, essentially, they say anything that's come in contact with the isopods, you should freeze for 72 hours before you throw it away. That's going to eliminate a lot of pests. Unfortunately, there are pests that will overwinter just fine. In other words, they will freeze solid and then wake up when you thaw them out. But it is going to take care of a lot of them. That is probably part of the reason that I prefer heat uh, sanitization. There are advantages and disadvantages to both types, but the heat is a lot less likely to um, allow things to survive if it's at 200 degrees for long enough. Not a whole lot that can survive that. The thing is, though, wood is a great insulator. So you have a big thick piece of wood and you put it in the oven for half an hour, 200 degrees, there are going to be parts inside the wood that are still quite cool by the time you get it out. So there's that. Crystals, pets, and plants. Frank to tank, welcome. Jeff, how much would you sell your multis for? It's going to be a while before I get them, but I will eventually get some. I'd love to get some from you. Um, I'll probably, I do sometimes sell them. I don't sell them too often because they're such a pain to get out. If you're a breeder who's interested in really selling large quantities of them, you don't keep them in seashells. You, I mean, snail shells, sorry, not seashells. You don't keep them in snail shells. You keep them in PVC elbows because they're a lot easier to remove. And I have mine in seashells, see, I keep saying that, snail shells because I prefer the look, but it practically, it's, it's really difficult. But I do sell some, and I think the going price is around $15 right now for multis. So um, if you do a little research and you find that's about where they are, then that's what I'll go with. Um, so yeah, something like that. Uh, what size tank should bumblebee millipedes have, geek guy? You can do a six quart tub for a pretty decent group of bumblebee millipedes. Once they look like they're a little overcrowded, you go up to a 16 quart and you can just keep going up, but 
yeah, a six quart should be fine for a while. And zero, cool, nice to see you here. Deanna, welcome back. Frank DeTank's finding toads in his backyard, cool. I uh, saw a lot of toads recently. You'll hear more about that later at some point. Okay, Critters and More on Patreon again has a question. Are lavas, Porcelio Scaber lava, still the only co-dominant morphs in the hobby? As far as I know, they are, but I'm not certain about it. Uh, it's the only one that I've known that's proven out that way so far, but there's so many things going on in the isopod hobby genetically, finding new species, all kinds of things, that uh, that's just I can only say as far as I know, really. But it's a great question. So Moombas, I can't remember if I asked this already, but have you taken any interest in keeping and breeding beetles? Certainly have. I have quite a few different beetle species, in fact, and I'm breeding a number of them. I have bred blue death feigning beetles uh, successfully a couple times now um, in terms of getting adult beetles, not just producing larvae, which is easy, and I've done that a million times. Um, and yeah. Of course, I breed superworms, mealworms, stuff like that, confused flower beetles. Uh, I have quite a, f a number of other beetles. Uh, I need to make some more videos of the beetles I have. I caught uh, some local cottonwood stag beetles last year, and they, I have some larvae that are, pu I have a pupa and some larvae from that. Hopefully, I'll get some adults soon. And I also have some other species of beetles that I haven't revealed yet that I uh, will probably reveal soon. Well, I've actually talked about my tenebrionid beetles with my velvet ants. I have, I don't know, probably five, six, seven species of tenebrionid beetles in there with my velvet ants, something like that. So, so sad florins, what does co-dominant mean? Co-dominant is when uh, you combine two different alleles of a gene in, uh, and they, express when there's only one copy of one of the genes. So a gene, instead of being just dominant, where it completely suppresses the expression of the other gene visually, a codominant uh, trait allows both traits to exhibit, uh, but to a lesser degree. Um, people get confused with incomplete dominance and with uh, codominance, but codominance is both traits are actually expressed fully in some areas of the animal, something like that, if that makes sense. So in a lava, when you have a, one copy of the lava gene, you have a mostly grayish, blackish isopod with some reddish-orange spots or markings on it, but they're limited. Um, when you have two copies of the gene, you get, usually it ends up being a reddish-orange animal with some black on it, so it's uh, much higher expression, if that makes sense. Hopefully so. Um, Then let's go back to another Patreon question. Sherry says, I just recently upgraded my lava enclosure since I had a huge baby boom. Awesome. I have seen some large, mostly dark, if there were any red, orange at all individuals. Could these individuals still breed the expressive lava morph or should they be separated? Assuming uh, codominance, which is what we believe Porcelia scaber lava is, as we were saying, if you find an individual with absolutely no red or orange on it, it's probably not carrying the gene. Now, I say probably because there could be things we don't know about the gene still. Um, I've heard other people say that it's more complex than codominance too, so there's that, um, you know, that's going on. So um, I think that is uh, probably as far as I can go on that one. I would separate them out, but maybe keep them in a, a bin by themselves and see what offspring they have, just in case, for a generation or so. Um, and then we have... Oh, Therapod Hunter is going to make a refugium. That's mm -hmm. awesome. All right, let's do another Patreon question. Ashley N. says, which giant Spanish isopod species are the easiest to care for? I just got some Morocco. They are gorgeous, but it's my first Spanish species. I would say um, Porcelio ornatus yellow dot, not Porcelio ornatus, ornatus um, high yellow, but yellow dot, and probably Porcelio ornatus um, nord are pretty easy ones to go with. Porcelio Hoffman's egg eye is actually pretty easy too. Um, I started with Porcelio Hoffman's egg eye, and then I think I got Ornatus 
but I can't remember if I got Onatus after I had other giant Spanish Porcelio. I say, uh, I think Porcelio Magnificus is one of the most difficult. Porcelio Expansus has actually been fairly easy for me, but I had had some experience by the time I got them. So, Willie, I do videos about isopods and other insects and other creatures. So, basically, Willie, to answer your question, anything that can be kept in a, an aquarium or vivarium, it's fair game for the channel. And occasionally we get little guys like this as well. But uh, generally, anything you can keep in an aquarium or, or vivarium, fair game. And I also, of course, do videos where I encounter such creatures out in the wild, like I've been doing lately. How many of you have seen my three-part series, of course there's only two of them so far, three, the third's coming out soon, uh, of my visit with uh, Sky Island Adventures. So that's Peter from Bugs in Cyberspace, it's Jesse from Shapes in Nature, um, and we went down, I went down a few weeks ago, visited them for several days, and had an incredible adventure. So if you haven't seen that, go check it out. Then my most recent two videos, the third one's coming out this Friday, and it was incredibly fun. So I hope uh, if you haven't seen it, you go check it out. All right, checking things out here. So Frank DeTank on our Blue Deathwing Beetle group on Facebook, we're having more and more people successfully breeding them. And that is awesome. That is exactly what I was hoping for, that by releasing videos on how uh, to breed them that we'd get people doing it and it's working. I've had people message me and say, hey look, I produced these five beetles using your methods that you explained, which of course I didn't originate, I just used them and publicized them, but um, pretty exciting. That's that's what I was hoping. We'll just get more captive breeding of the beetles going on. Uh-oh, my bird just flew to the ground. Let me pick him up and put him back on my shoulder where he goes. Okay, so Kevin, Zay, welcome. GX Cat, hello. So, Ruby Perez, do you have any new merch coming up sometime in the future? Possibly. I've been pondering that. I think it's about time I come up with some new merch. And I would like to ask everybody, what would you like? What kind of merch would you be interested in? You can tell me, like, the type of apparel or different things you want. If you want stickers, you know, whatever. But also tell me what you'd like on it. I mean, I do a lot of isopod stuff. This one I didn't create myself, but I, I do love this shirt. But uh, this one was... Uh, by Jabberwork on uh, Etsy. He, he sells these. So let me know. Okay. So, Theropod Hunter, your lava's breeding habits are giving your dairy cows a run for their money. They are pretty prolific for Porcelio Scaber, aren't they? I've noticed that too. So, Kevin, your boa has been settled in, is settling in, working on with her handling. She's a bit hissy at the moment. That can happen. Is this the, the boa you're, you're rescuing that's... Uh, had had been eating too much. <laughs> All right. So, Azir, or Azir, I'm not sure how to say your name. Hopefully I got close. How do you prove out genes in isopods? I roughly understand how to do it with animals like snakes, but breeding isopods is a lot more difficult to control. It is a little bit more difficult to control. Um, one of the reasons is that uh, Isopods, you know, when a snake mates once, typically you'll get one clutch of eggs or maybe two, or, or babies if it's, a, you know, a live-bearing snake. Sometimes two, but generally after that, you don't have to worry about it, generally speaking. And uh, so you can know that the next time the snake mates, it's going to have uh, babies with the male you mated it with. And with isopods, that's not the case. Also, isopods can mate when they're very, very young, and so you have to separate them out at very, very young ages. Um, basically, what I do is separate them out at very, very young ages, put a group of isopods together with the traits I want to work with. So maybe I'll put 12 of one trait and 12 of another trait together at a very young age. And then because their offspring are going to be het, usually, most traits uh, are recessive, they're going to be, so there'll be hets that won't express it, uh, that won't express the traits, then uh, I can recognize them visually, take them out, put them together, not keeping them with their parents. And then some of those, you know, offspring will end up with the trait I want. It takes a long time with isopods, longer than you might think. And let's see. Um, okay, trying to catch up. Hopefully that helps. And Ruby, glad you've been loving the recent videos. I've been having fun with them a lot. It was such a fun trip. It was so fun. 
Oh, Jeff, sorry that happened with the Queen Ant. Oh, young lad, good. Uh, I'm, I'm open for suggestions on t-shirt designs. Isopod cufflinks, I love that, actually. That's cool. And zero cool, dwarf purples are fairly easy to get going. They were one of the first species I worked with. Yeah, pretty easy. Is it candle or candy? I don't have my glasses on, but 444. T-shirt saying I have thousands of pets <laughs> and a picture of each one, right? Stickers and maybe a tote bag. Awesome. And Mr. and Mrs. Morelli. Well, thank you. Yeah, the Sky and Adventure Equip. Seriously, I have to go back. I'm just excited to go back. Next year, um, I'm definitely going back. And this is going to be a tradition. At least once a year, I want to go. Um, oh, young lad, you were waiting and got sidetracked. That's okay. You're here. So nine species of isopods Leia, and eight of them are doing great, but my Armadillidium klugai Montenegro keep dying. Okay, well, quickly, have you watched my video on care for that species? Because I give some specific tips for that species, but I'll give you some now too. One, make sure you don't mist them at all. Trickle water down the side of the moss, uh, the, down the side of the enclosure where the moss is, on the mossy wet side, and mm, moist side, not even wet. Um, rather than misting. Never mist them. Keep at least half of the enclosure completely dry. Okay? So, um, and then they always need a moist spot. But, and then put a hide that bumps up against the moist area, hide on the dry area, maybe a hide that is, goes on both. And typically that helps a lot. Also, they do need decent ventilation. Okay. Okay. So that's your, your Lacey J. Awesome. Okay, cool. Sometimes the name's the same in Patreon, sometimes it's not. So good to know. I can keep that in mind. And Frank to Tank, I love watching queen uh, ants develop and develop a brood and hold on all that whole process. It's kind of fun. Um, let's see. Zip up hoodie, Armadillidium species, Porcelia species, Cubaris for, uh, from Ashley N. Nice. Separate shirts for the different types. I, I get what you're saying. Separate shirts. And I have been thinking about that, so that's a, that's a good suggestion. I'll see what I can do with that. Um, and Aussie Ant Keeping. I do have Instagram. Um, last time I checked, I was like, it's pretty small compared to my YouTube channel, about 27 hundred followers so nearly 3,000 followers on Instagram pretty small though um, compared and it's about uh, it's just at aquarium expats one word no spaces or anything and Natty the Panda welcome I'm doing pretty well glad to see you here okay shirt idea coming from Malus Ignatius and I, I, I will sometime keep ants. They're kind of expensive to set up the pro proper enclosures, though. I love the stuff that Ants Canada does, but going to pricey, you know what I mean? Bit pricey. But not, not anything bad. It's just kind of expensive stuff. Microvarium. Welcome. You know, I'm, I've got a video coming out with Microvarium. Got sent me a cool enclosure to test out. And I'll be making that soon. I'm finishing up with my uh, Sky Island Adventure series. And then I'll be working on a couple of other projects, including the Microvarium project. So keep, uh, keep that in mind, everybody. It's coming up soon. Okay. So Ashley Neville, what are the biggest differences between Porcelio Scaber Lava and Red Calico? Good question. I think the genetic difference we've been talking about is, is a big difference. That the co-dominance in the Red Calico. I mean, not the Red Calico, the, the Lava. I also think, now I haven't worked with red calico specifically, it's not a group that I worked with, so could be wrong, uh, a morph, if you will, that I, I have not worked with, but I think they're, they're more speckled um, rather than large patches of coloration. I believe that uh, from what the pictures that I've seen that that's the case. If anybody knows differently, correct me, so, and take that with a grain of salt please Ashley, but I believe that is the case. <laughs> Malice Ignatius. 
shirt with isopod ID chart, but instead of binomials, just have first names. Like Bob, Billy Sue, that's Dave. <laughs> I like it. Okay, so Roger, Roger Loeb. I'm interested in anything on this topic, so the Perselius Caber lava topic. My regular lava population isn't too high yet, but I'm three weeks into my lava crossing project. I want to start with 10 other morphs, but only have the populations for five right now. I have brewing five, five, lava plus wild, pied, ember, orange Dalmatian, and black koi. If I understand Kodom correctly, I should end up with all lavas. I'm still hopeful something interesting might pop up, but time will tell. So it'll be interesting to see how the effects happen but you might end up with some low expression lavas in that first generation if mm, things express as we expect them to. Uh, and in some cases, you will end up with probably things that look like low expression lavas and are not showing the other trait. Like if you cross um, with the wild type, you, I would expect you to see some low expression lavas in that first generation. With the orange Dalmatian, you probably will not see any orange or Dalmatian in the first, you'll just see low expression lavas, but if you cross those low expression lavas to each other, you might get some uh, tricolor isopods, something like that. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, hoping something interesting might pop up, but time will tell. Yep, indeed, that's what we have to wait for. Do you keep expenses? I do love expenses. Had my colony for a little over a year now. Not sure if sexing them is the same. Well, you can sex them really young actually by their Europods, the exopodite Europods that stick out uh, in the back. They're a lot longer in a male, even when they're very young. So you can. I think right now I have seven females and lost the other five, which are mostly juveniles. I'm not sure if any of the females are carrying, as I haven't seen any monka yet after about five weeks. Don't give up hope yet because they can mate at pretty young ages. So um, it's very possible that you could still get some. Okay, coming back. So Theropod Hunter, so my lava babies are pale. I wonder if it's a different morph or just discolored. Interesting. I keep my eye on that. I, I mean, it depends on how young they are. I mean, when they're very young, they're going to be pale anyway. But um, it sounds like some of them are old enough not to be pale. So, yeah, keep your eye on it. It could be something different. Um, Kevin Zay, any advice on keeping dairy cows from drowning my garter snake's water bowl? I've trimmed plants and moved anything climbable away. Part of the problem is dairy cows are big. I mean, their bodies are tall. They're, they tend to be really bold and active, and they can climb over anything. They're basically, the only thing you can do is get a taller water dish that they can't climb up. So smooth-sided, taller water dish. Still, of course, shallow enough, it's not going to hurt the garter snakes, but, you know, garter snakes can handle a fairly deep water dish. So if you have some really smooth ceramic, uh, like, glaze on the outside of the dish, and it's tall enough, you know, probably two or three inches should be tall enough if nothing's bumping up against it that should keep them from uh, crawling in. I have the same issue with my uh, Armadillidium klugai in with my garter snakes. I have a huge colony of Armadillidium klugai in there, but uh, they occasionally, if I, I gotta watch where I put the water bowl. If I put it too close to anything, they climb up. Uh, the water bowl is tall enough for them because they're smaller than dairy cows that normally they can't get in unless I, there's something up the first side. So, Raylan Nicole, any tips on taking caring for Dalmatian ice pods? Getting 20, they should be getting here next week. Dalmatians are pretty simple, fortunately. They don't need a lot of ventilation. They're not particularly picky about a humidity gradient, but offering one is good. So moderate amount of ventilation is fine. Um, they do like a little bit of protein and a lot of leaves and a lot of hiding places. Uh, they will be, they should do really well for you. Just don't overfeed them while they're getting established. But once they uh, get established, you want to give them enough food to keep them going and, and make sure that leaf litter and protein are high on the list. But yeah, too much ventilation um, can dry them out, of course. So just moderate ventilation is good. So Ashley, yeah, yeah it could be that that was a lava in your uh, lotto mix. It's possible if it's more patched than spotted. And Natty the Panda, how easy is it to import insects, especially beetles from other countries? I'm in Brazil and there's really nowhere actually buy insects to keep. I don't know for Brazil. In the U.S. it's really hard to get beetles in. There are a few beetles that are approved or exempt from, you know, regulations, but most beetles are really hard to get in. But I don't know about Brazil. Good question. 
anybody else knows, that would be awesome. All right. So Sandy uh, has a couple of questions. Sandy Sizemore says, okay, how about this? Do you bake or boil everything you use for ice pod enclosures? How do you feel about providing them a more sterile environment versus an environment with pesticide-free ingredients and why? Okay. So I do bake essentially everything I put with ice pods. The exception is dry sphagnum moss really doesn't have much in it. And so I usually won't bake that. But everything else, including cork bark, uh, leaves, uh, base substrate, everything. I guess things like cuttlebone I don't, but um, basically everything. Mm -hmm. And I think I like providing, I, I recognize the benefit of putting in materials from outside, but I also recognize the risks of doing that. So you'll get um, some stability from the microfauna that you'll be introducing in terms of uh, microbes, ba bacteria and, and things like that, that you'll be introducing if you're using things from outside, but it's also a wild card. You could be introducing pests as well. Uh, if that's what you're asking, I think that's part of it. Um, and I think I, you know, I don't spray our trees or lawn or garden or whatever, so we have a pretty uh, low risk of introducing pesticides into the uh, environment from collecting leaves outside and so on, but I do worry about pests themselves. So hopefully that helps. And great questions, everybody. I believe those are all of the patron questions. I'm going to have to wrap up a little bit early today, but I'm going to go through a couple more and then we'll uh, call it good. So let's see. He's a cute little bird, isn't he, Willie? Um, so Dallin, as long as the humidity is really low where you're keeping them, in where I live, it's pretty dry. It takes about three days to a week on average for the beetles to turn uh, kind of a light blue. So is your humidity high in your house? It also may depend on how thoroughly it was removed. It might take a little longer. Are they, have they started to turn blue at all? Or have you noticed a progression towards lighter blue? If not, I would recommend maybe lowering the humidity. Maybe you need to increase ventilation or airflow or something like that. And what inspired me to keep isopods? It was actually bioactive avaria. I wanted to start keeping bioactive avaria about nine years ago or something like that. Started doing research, probably longer than that now when I started researching it, and was noticing that people were keeping dart frogs in bioactive avaria, and that's what that got me started. And Shiv got some new isopods. Awesome. And Luna, you'd love new merch as well. Okay, I'm going to be working on it. Shirt with all kinds of isopods on it would be cool. Has anybody seen the isopods on the move shirt on my Teespring store? Um, that's that's a, a fun one. It has lots of different isopods on it. It's just got isopods. They're like in diagonal of different species going along the shirt. So check that out. Yeah, mon monsoon season in Arizona. Um, they're starting to seem light gray. Okay, that's that's a good sign. Maybe they'll be okay. And yeah, I have Teespring. Just go to Teespring Aquarimax, do a search, and you'll see some shirts and uh, other merch. I think I have a few other things there too. So stickers and whatnot. So everybody check it out. Please keep your eye out for my video on Friday. And thanks for joining in, everybody. It's been great to uh, catch up with you a little bit. Hopefully I caught all the patron questions. And uh, everybody stay safe and stay healthy. See you soon.